Welcome to Smartest, Smartest, Smartest Tells, Tells His History. All right, enough with the echo and fanfare. You're here for history, right? And not that boring crap you learned in high school. This stuff's actually interesting. Like things you've never heard about the Civil War, Cleopatra, automobiles, Monopoly, the Black Plague, and more. Fascinating stories, interesting topics, and some downright weird facts from the past. It's a new twist on some stories you may know, and an interesting look at some things you may have never heard. So, grab a beer, kick back, and enjoy. Here's your host, Smarticus. Hello, and welcome to this week's episode of Smarticus Tells History, where we explore some of the most fascinating stories from, well, history. I am your host, Smarticus, accompanied by my co-host, Phoenix. Hello! Today we'll be discussing one of the most bizarre conflicts in Australian history, the Great Emu War. That's right, folks, Australia went to war with emus. Not once, but twice. And lost. <laughs> it's such a tragic thing. I don't know how you get a war with an animal and lose. Like, Oh, you'll find out my opinion on the matter. I know, because I wrote this. Uh, but... Yeah. <laughs> Oh, God, the story. When I first heard about it, uh, it just, I think it was a, a guy on a comedy show. He was on that thing that I, I think I sent you the link for it. Yeah. And uh, he was talking about how he was an Australian guy and he was talking about how his country went to war with emus. Did you know that lost. we went to war with emus? Yeah. yeah. And lost. Exactly. Well, we've got shepherd's pie. Yeah, so for this week's uh, food item, we made Australian shepherd pie. We used two different recipes. Uh, Phoenix used very fancy... Uh, Gordon Ramsay's shepherd's pie. Whereas I went to Australia's best recipes, and I found Mum's shepherd, uh, shepherd's pie. And I don't know what the difference is going to be. She said you had corn in yours. Yeah. My recipe did not call for corn. Mine called for carrots. Um, and then like I was telling you, um, my recipe also calls for one kilogram of beef mince, where I just used a package of stew meat. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I didn't care if it was minced or not. Um, did yours call for um, wine? No. So mine. Okay. Oh. So my recipe here is uh, one kilogram of one kilogram beef mince, uh, one onion finely chopped large, one carrot finely chopped. Um, and for the carrot, I just bought a package of shredded carrots. Mm. Um, I was going to share uh, shred it myself. I was going to buy a thing of carrots and shred it myself. Um, but when we made the babodi that called for the grated lemon zest, mm-hmm. um, I took my grater and I made it, but I cut my hand open when using it. Oh dang! Um, like using the grater, uh-huh. like, like, and it was just like it was just like a little bit, just like my knuckles. They just they they scraped just a tiny bit across the grater. Oh man! And uh, so I was like, well, I was like, for one thing, I've never used a grater before. I can guarantee I was holding it wrong most likely because that I see people going to town on graters and they never cut themselves. That's um, from practice. <laughs> that's just from practice. Yeah, they probably have cut themselves numerous times, but oh, yeah. um, so I was like, I'll just buy the shredded kind this time and not worry about it. <laughs> It made you um, skittish, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, it made me skittish. Um, and uh, so, okay, so it's got, and this just says finely chopped. Um, uh-huh. So, I mean, I could have just, you know, chopped up into, you know, teeny tiny pieces. Yeah, it wanted um, my uh, veggies to be finely grated. Oh, did it? Okay, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, mine called for a quarter a tablespoon of thyme. Um, now, I didn't have the thyme, uh, like, the whole time. I, um, <laughs> I had a... a uh, powdered time. Oh, okay. Yeah, I had no time. No, but I used the powdered time. Okay. Um, instead of the, uh, I figured it's a quarter tablespoon. Like it's not going to matter. It shouldn't matter. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if it will or not. Um, tomato paste, one tablespoon tomato paste, a tablespoon of Worcestershire sauce. No. <laughs> oh. Uh, two tablespoons of soy sauce. Soy. Yep. One, uh, one and a half cup of maple beef style liquid stock. See, mine had had me using chicken stock. Really? Really. I thought it was strange, too, but that's what it says. Yeah. Um, And I thought, um, I I couldn't remember. I had to think of beef broth, and I was like, well, I could probably use beef broth. And then I was like, no, that's right, because 
because broth is made from the juices mm-hmm. um, or the, the meat, whereas the stock is made from the bone. Right. So it's like it probably would taste different. So Much more rich. Um, yeah. And so I put in, uh, oh, yeah, and it calls for salt and pepper to taste, um, two tablespoons of plain flour, and a quarter cup of water. And then I cheated with the mashed potatoes. <laughs> um, it says topping was 750 grams of potatoes. I don't know how many potatoes that is. Um, and then it says six, uh, 60 grams of butter, a quarter cup of milk, and a pinch of salt. And again, uh, more salt and pepper to taste. Um, I just used instant mashed potatoes. Um, I used the herb and butter, instant mashed, instant mashed potatoes. I had potatoes I could have made, right? You know, fresh mashed potatoes. Um, but again, I got lazy and. So I use regular mashed potatoes or and I'm sorry, instant mashed potatoes. Um, and uh, I have them sitting here. I'm talking about I haven't even tried mine yet other than a little snippet that I had earlier. Um, I know we were trying down on yours. Was it? I am. It I'm, good? I'm, mine's delicious, but <laughs> I get some of the meat in here. Oh, yeah. And so mine. So I also I added the uh, bell peppers in mine, too. Oh, yeah. You told me that. Um, Mm-hmm. Instead of, I just put the, uh, I didn't chop up an onion myself. I just took one of them frozen packets of mm-hmm. the onions and bell peppers, or whatever that's already chopped up and stuff. And I just put um, roughly, um, I think it was like a, a cup in there. I figured it equals somewhere around one onion. Um, I think it's actually, I think it was actually a little bit like three quarters of a cup. Gotcha. Like that. And that's what I put in it. See, and mine wanted, it was insisting it needed to be lamb, but unfortunately, I would have had to go probably into Yoder meat into Wichita and get mm-hmm. lamb. And I was like, I'm just going to stick with, with beef. And or then Sig's meat, Sig's meat's up there when I had it. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I had I, mine called for a red wine and mine also wanted time as well, but it also called for rosemary. Oh, really? Yeah. I mean, it's very, very aromatic. Well, it's I mean, tasty. let's be honest. Gordon, Gordon Ramsay is the master. Um, <laughs> Have you seen? His, his really probably is really good. I have a book of his that I haven't even opened yet. Oh, sacrilege. I bought a hard a hard copy book of his. Uh, it's his, was it healthy, lean, and fit cooking recipes or something like that? Nice. Mm-hmm. I saw the video of him and his mom making shepherd's pie together. She was making her version oh. and he was making his. And she, <laughs> she's so funny. She schooled him. She goes, here's this nice deer. And he goes, what's wrong? <laughs> Because he knew, he knew mom was, mom was telling him it wasn't as good as hers. Yeah. And apparently she yeah. was right. Oh. Oh my gosh, that was funny. She should write her own cookbook. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love this. This is delicious. Yeah, I agree. I don't know why I've never eaten this it This is before. very good. Yeah, this is very good. And uh, it's almost... Um, very similar to, to what I put in. Um, well, almost like the um, uh, what was <laughs> the, what did we make? Uh, with the, goulash? the blood count is the goulash. Goulash, yeah. Um, it's it's almost a very similar recipe, only it's mashed potatoes instead of uh rice. Right. Well, we well it, it it didn't call for rice. We we put rice. Yep. Well, I put mine over rice. Did you put yours over rice? I think I put mine over mashed remember. potatoes actually. Did you? Okay, well, so yeah. you, you basically did do this, then, yeah. And you use that's right, and you use sour cream. Mm-hmm. And I thought about putting sour cream in this too. I thought it was going to be good, but I decided against it for this one time. <laughs> I think next time I make this, because I will definitely make this again, I'm going to yeah, add more um, cheese. Yeah. Into the um, yeah, so the mashed potato cover part. That's yeah. I I tried to layer it as thick as I possibly could, like a lasagna. Um. And I let it sit for too long because then it got kind of hard. Mm. Um, but it's still good. It's still breaking up pretty easy now that I'm eating it and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and I made sure to leave plenty over, plenty left over for. Uh, I'm gonna take it to work tomorrow. For, it's gonna be a launch. Nice. And, uh, it's uh, three o'clock now, so it might be more of a later dinner for me too. Yeah, I'm happy. I have a ha- happy, happy tummy. This is very good, yeah. Um, and so, we'll see. Now, this is also Australian shepherd pie. 
And we were talking before I think um, mine about might how be more English. Sorry. Yeah, it's very possible. Um, well, he, I mean, he is, he is British too. So I mean, he it is. Would, so that would make I'm more saying. sense. Now that I think about yeah. it, it might be more. It British. would make more sense. Yeah. All right. Um, but uh, I mean, it didn't really matter. I mean, it's still, I mean, I think a shepherd's pie, shepherd's pie. Right. Um, but uh, there, there probably is a difference between English and Australian, though. But it's probably mostly the same. Well, one of them certainly has only... lamb, and neither one of us did that. Yeah, one of them, yeah. So that was the other thing I was going to say. Um, I believe that mine said that you could, sub- let me see, I believe I saw something down here um, where they you can substitute it with lamb or because I remember seeing that. Mm-hmm. Um, it might have been when I was just researching the recipe that I saw it. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, no, right here. Um, it says in the notes for this recipe here. Yeah. Um, I have used chicken stock successfully to uh, score potato mixture with a fork, uh, as this helps to make it, uh, make it crisp and country, mm-hmm. crunchy, country, <laughs> crunchy, <laughs> uh, crisp and crunchy. <laughs> um, and uh, make sure that you don't put the lid on it uh, when you put it in the oven. The topping won't oh, right. crisp up. Yeah. Nope. And I just used, um, I used that, uh, the Levant, uh, Lavagna. The broiler? Lasagna. Uh, no, I, I put it in the oven, but, um, uh, I, uh, put it in a, like a smaller, I'm not, I'm, I'm struggling here to, to get this out. Uh, <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> I use a smaller, like a lasagna, like a baking dish. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, like I use my casserole dish. Casserole dish. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, I use a smaller one. Mine, uh, so I didn't use the, the big lasagna one, which is a, it's like a nine by thirteen or eight eight mm-hmm. by thirteen. I can't remember the dimension of the the bigger lasagna one. I think it's eight one. by thirteen. Uh, but I use the one that was just slightly smaller. Um, I think it's it was like six inches by ten inches or something like that. Okay. Um, it was you know it was a little bit smaller one um, because I was afraid that I didn't make enough for the bigger pan for it to fill right. up properly the way, the way it, uh, I wanted it to. Right. Um, and uh, but then, so I didn't do, like you were saying, I guess that's what Gordon Hamsey was saying to do on his, like use your fork to Yeah, to, to score, make, it. To score I it. I know, to, I didn't do it either. Yeah, I just I, I just used, about it, but I used my fork, so I mean, I guess I, I used my fork to put the lasagna in, so I mean, I guess I kind of inadvertently did it, but I think I was more smoothing it than, than actually like scoring it when I was putting it in there. Yeah, um, I was smoothing mine down. Yeah. As well. I wasn't thinking about making it look pretty. Yeah. Uh, but then down here, it also says, if you like the sound of this recipe, you might also like this with leftover lamb shepherd's pie. See? So she has... Lamb. Yeah, they have a leftover... Uh, a lamb shepherd's pie also. Mm-hmm. Which, of course, are very happy in Australia. Yeah. They do very well out there. Yeah, I don't know if we have very many lambs over here. Um, I think we mostly have goats and uh, sheep and, and stuff. But Yeah. There's a um, goat farm uh, about two miles north of me. Is there? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think we have mostly have goats. and Actually, I don't even know how much sheep we actually have over here either. I think it's mostly uh, goats, really. Hmm. Goats and cattle. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. If you go um, way far north up to Hayes, it's just bison. Oh yeah, big old buffalo. Yeah, and um, they smell. Which used so to be nearly extinct. If, if people didn't know that, buffalo used to mm-hmm. be nearly extinct because when yep. we came over from uh, England, we nearly wiped them all out. Yep, trapping and furring and having a grand mm-hmm. old time. Actually, we get to thank um, what's his name, Wild Bill. We get to thank him for that because he decided he was going to bring him back from the brink and that's what he did up in Hayes actually <laughs> he named Hayes he you, founded it do you know what this sounds like to me hmm sounds like another episode idea <laughs> doesn't look like to me all right cool I'm down I used to live there for a year so I can help I've never lived in Hayes um but an episode on Wild Bill that sounds like a good idea uh, man was crazy but really kind of cool yeah um we uh when I, say, when I say we I mean me um I don't know why I said we. Um, I've never lived in Hayes. 
Um, it's and, not uh, much to write home about, I'm afraid. Sorry, Hayes. I love you. You guys are wonderful, but I did not enjoy my time there. Is it kind of like about playing? You blinking and miss it, like it's so small. No, it's it's you'll you'll definitely see it. It's just it's a college town, and to the south. Oh is yeah, that's right. I forgot huge, it's a college there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But to the south, they have um, their big old buffalo ranches. Yeah. And when you know, because Kansas is you know the people of the South Wind, mm-hmm. the wind kicks up. And most of the year, all you smell is buffalo poo. It's so yeah. not enjoyable. Yeah. We had fun when we were there, but we was still, it was one of those times where I was like, I, we need to go somewhere else. Yeah. No, yeah, I, I agree. So I remember, uh, I remember um, when, well, for, they have that cow town there. Now, is that still there? Mm-hmm. They, they t- it was when I was there. Uh, yeah, so I mean, it's gone in and out of business like three or four times when I lived there. Um, and but they also have um, the old famous Dodge City. And if you drive out to Dodge City, mm-hmm. um, they have a very similar but much larger um, version of Cowtown. And it's oh, pretty. Yeah. It's pretty cool. If you ever, if you they are very there. proud of their yeah, heritage. It was very cool. With... Yeah. But yeah. Um. Now that's on the. Uh, western, southwestern corner of uh, Kansas. Um, if anybody's wondering, and mm-hmm. they uh, there's not really a whole lot of bison up there, but um, in fact, I believe, unfortunately, well, I think it's mostly a lot of just cattle, um, like slaughterhouses that are in there now. Yeah. Um, the stockades are the, everywhere yeah. out there because there's just so much land, right? And but it, unfortunately, it does smell there, and I think it's because of those. Especially those during pl- summer. Yeah, and that's and that's exactly where we went, and you can smell it, and it's oh, that's the yeah. bad part about it. Yeah. Yeah, there is a really cool. Um, if anyone ever decides to go to Hayes, Kansas, there is a really awesome museum for uh, fossils and dinosaurs up there because they have found so many different kinds of species up there mm-hmm. that. They're like, fine, let's open up a museum. That's cool, yeah. It's cool. Well, first we have to set the stage. So the Australian market during the latter half of the 1920s was taking a serious turn for the worse. The Wall Street crash of 1929 led to a worldwide economic depression. By 1932, Australia's unemployment moved up to 32%. World War I soldiers were given land by the government in the western rural areas of the country which any John Wayne fan can say is never free or a thing as good as it sounds. The government promised assistance in the form of subsidiaries and then failed for many reasons to follow through. This led to the former soldiers debating about harvesting their crops and telling the government they wouldn't get any of it. Yeah, so I could I could understand their skepticism um, skepticism mm-hmm. about, about that. Um, and it just dawned on me too, Australia being in World War One and Two is not something even number number two, even World War Two uh, is not something that you really uh, think about. I guess at least at least I don't. I don't know if you do, but I don't. <laughs> uh, I do because I watch a lot of. Uh, um, if anyone's ever heard of Miss Franny Fisher's murder mysteries, or watched the mo- the shows or read the books. You, you probably thought about it too because it's right around the time just after World War Two and she, uh, World War One and she comes home. It's just one of those things that I don't like. I know they're there, but I just mm-hmm. I don't really <clears throat> think about it until it comes up, and I'm like, oh yeah, they were there. I just they like, weren't a huge yeah. presence like right. you know Germany was or England, England, France, or us for that matter. Later, mm-hmm. in, you know, toward the end of the war, um, and uh, yeah. But they were there. Yeah. They were trying to help. Yeah. All right. So, cue the world's second largest flightless bird, the emu. Coming in just under the ostrich, which on average comes in around nine feet and two inches, while the emu is typically six feet and two inches. While the females lay the eggs, they are also the larger of the species, also the more aggressive. The males, once a clutch has been laid are the ones who do the brooding and taking care of the chicks once they hatch. When the breeding season is over, they migrate to the coast from their inland breeding grounds. 
often traveling in groups as small as two, though they will move in larger herds, all with the same goal to find a new food source. And that that makes me think of uh, uh, Jumanji, too. Yes. Juggle the, or whatever, I can't remember. The set, I guess technically it's the third Jumanji. Um, oh, I haven't seen that one. It's, uh, well, you have the original, and then they have the remake, and then you have the, mm-hmm. the second one. Um, to me, it's it's the third Jumanji. Gotcha. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the one with Robin Williams is, I, I think it's still better. But they're, but the one at The yeah. Rock and, and Kevin Hart, I mean, they're, <laughs> Kevin Hart, don't yeah. wrong, they're great, too. They're very hilarious. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, so it reminds me of, uh, oh, it was Welcome to the Jungle. I think it's what it was. I think that's what it's called. Jumanji to Welcome to the Jungle. Of course. Uh, but they have the scene in there now. It was ostriches, not emus, but uh, mm-hmm. where they're running down the, the side of the desert. Um, have you not seen the second one? No. Oh, man. I just ruined it. I keep meaning to. I just haven't alert. done it yet. Okay. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah, it's a spoiler alert. Spoiler okay. alert. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, this was easily facilitated by the fact that farms had popped up all over the usually barren land with food and water sources all sanctioned by the government. Weren't they lucky? The emus, not the farmers. No, the farmers were very unlucky because the emus destroyed fencing that typically kept back rabbits, which (laughs) was a huge problem there. It still is to this day. And it also allowed these enormous birds and their new flock of babies in. Farmers from Chandler to Walgulan reported their plight to the government, hoping that finally help would come. An ex-soldier delegation was sent to talk to the Minister of Defense, George Pierce. Having the benefit of knowledge from the war, they understood how very effective a machine gun could be against invading forces. It was their hope that they could talk the minister into allowing them the guns and ammunition to eradicate the new plague. Surprisingly, Pierce agreed, under the proviso that the guns were to be used by the military personnel, the farmers would provide food, accommodation, and payment for the ammunition while troop transport was to be financed by the Western Australian government. Of course, Minister Pierce thought it was also a great excuse to do target practice, which sounds a lot like men looking for an excuse to do super awesome explosive pyrotechnics. I'm not judging, just calling it like I see it. Anyways, it didn't hurt that it made him look as if he were helping out the farmers, chalking one up to keeping and getting votes. Major Gwyneth Purvis Wine Aubrey Meredith of the Royal Australian Artillery's 7th Heavy Artillery was placed in charge of the war against the emus, armed with two Lewis guns and 10,000 rounds. The plan was to use the machine guns to mow down the emus in large numbers. The first battle took place after delay from heavy rainfall on November 2nd, 1932, in the Campion District of Western Australia. The plan was that they would collect 100 emu skins so that they could use the feathers for hats. However, the ginormous birds proved to be formidable opponents. They were fast, agile and difficult to hit as you can imagine if you've seen any videos of emus being startled by loud sounds and proceeding to run around like a chicken with its head cut off forgive the metaphor uh, you've seen that right oh when yeah there's backfire from- oh yeah oh, they're off the eggs yeah. <laughs> they that's uh yeah there's Kevin, a there's Kevin. a facebook reel yeah yeah, yeah. i've just seen that yeah <laughs> Oh my god, oh it was god. a gun and he runs around it. Yeah. He's like, no, it was just, it was just the car backfiring. There's no gun. Yeah. And his name's Kevin. Yeah. <laughs> Kevin the emu. Yeah. God, that kills me every I time. Like, I like watching those uh <coughs> voiceovers with pets. They're they're hilarious. Yes. Oh my gosh. The first day of the operation, the soldiers reported that they had killed perhaps a dozen, which is a direct quote. The rest of the birds had escaped the emus learned quickly to avoid the areas where the soldiers were stationed, making the next significant event in the war two days later. Meredith made plans to ambush a herd of about a thousand near a dam, making them easy targets only to find out how incredibly wrong he was. The soldiers struggled to control the gun, which overheated and jammed frequently, while the vehicles they were mounted on had terribly rough terrain to travel over. The birds scattered once more and weren't seen again for the rest of the day. I can imagine how difficult that was. Um, it's so frustrating too, you know, because it's they had this plan in their head and they thought, oh, for sure, we're just it'll be easy because they're dumb emus, you know. Oh yeah. Only to find out that they're the dumb ones. <laughs> <laughs> More or less, yeah. I mean, they uh, they didn't really put in a whole lot of thought into it from from what it sounds. Um, no, and it gets so much worse. I'm we sure- were only on the first war. Right. There's two. Right. 
I mean, I'm sure, surely there was more thought that was put into it. Um, but things just, you know, things go wrong, I guess. But oh, the fact yeah. that their guns like overheating and stuff, they, I mean, you would know the guy shooting a gun must have been new because you a, a season, a season, you know, uh, soldier knows that if you repeatedly shoot your weapon over and over and over, uh, it's going to overheat. Um, yep. The fact that they jammed frequently, well, unfortunately, that was very common for a lot of weapons back in the day. Um, right. I mean, it, j- weapon jams still happen today, but now they're not. I don't think they're as uh, frequent because we've learned, hey, clean your guns regularly and they won't jam as much. <laughs> right. And don't use dirty ammo. Mm. Um, but... Uh, of course weapons you know they're just they're just built a lot better now and they're not <clears throat> uh let's see this was in world war one time frame 1932 uh-huh. okay, yeah. this was after that's right yeah okay so it was after world war one so just after yeah so they were uh for some reason i was thinking they were still using black powder guns but they they wouldn't have been by then um mm-hmm. i don't think I, no no they were no they were they uh, had they had revolvers just, and pistols yeah and stuff. they had just came out with the yeah um, I'm sorry, that's the same thing, isn't it? Revolvers and pistols? Not but necessarily. What, not all pistols are revolvers, right. but revolvers are always pistols. Right. I have to run through that in my head every yeah. time. <clears throat> and the uh, pistols back then, they would have been flintlock, um, not a revolver. Well, during this time, during they this had time, they would have been revolver. But what I'm saying yeah. is, yeah, back when with the black powder and stuff, it would have been a flintlock. Oh, pistol. yes. Yeah. 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 Um,. The operation continued for several weeks, but the emus proved to be elusive for the soldiers. Army observers noted each pack seems to have its own leader now, a big black plum bird which stands fully six feet high and keeps watch while his mates carry out their work of destruction and warns them of their approach. On November 8, 1932, the media got wind of the operation and the story quickly became a sensation. Newspapers around the world published articles about the Great Emu War, and it became <laughs> a laughing stock in international media. Well, because you just don't think of, you know, anybody thinking, oh, it's a great plan. We should totally wage war on emus. Yeah. And then so did they did they eat the emus? I mean, you said they're I mean, I we said earlier um, they're going to use their skins and stuff. I would presume that they would eat the emus. You would hope. I would hope that they would eat, just eat them and not just kill them. But I mean, I guess yeah. I mean, I understand even still like um, as lovely and cuddly as turtles are they're also a very evasive um species um right. and if they're full of my pond um well like my dad did they were they were full of his pond and they, he was pretty sure they they kept eating his bait and stuff that was in there yes um, which they are they will definitely do yeah so he just went out there and he just shot them all um <laughs> and uh they uh That's such an old farmer thing to do yeah. i mean what do you do with them i mean you can make turtle soup out of them, I guess, but I'm not going to eat a turtle that's been... Eat turtle. Yeah, I wouldn't... I mean... Although I hear emu is really delicious, and like we were talking about... Oh, I'd eat the crap, I'd eat really the crap good, out of an but... emu. <laughs> <clears throat> but... um, I've had ostrich jerky, and it's very good. Yeah? Uh, yeah, it's very good. Um, I mean, it tastes a lot like regular beef jerky, uh, but I mean, it was still, it was still good. Um, nice. Craziest thing I ever ate... Well, two things... A squirrel and alligator, and both of them were in gumbo. And we can thank my grandma Mary for that. Oh, she's from Louisiana, so were they fresh? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah well, <laughs> the squirrel my dad he got <laughs> my my biological dad, right? Yeah, he was he caught the squirrels. My grandma was like, okay, I'll cook it up. Yeah, waste not, want not was her big motto. Well, I'm at, I'm at the alligator, not the squirrels. Oh, sorry. Uh, yes, she got those, I believe, from her sister, because her sister still lived down in Louisiana. My aunt Renee. Ruth. Oh, she'd come up every or... time. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. her sons were in the fishing industry, and they'd also sometimes oh, okay, yeah. go out and hunt alligator, and then they'd bring you know the uh, the meat to mom, and then she would take care of it. And then sometimes my uh, my aunt would come up; she would come up with these huge um, coolers just packed full of crawfish and crab and shrimp and alligator and all kinds of other stuff. Sounds really good. Yeah. And then they just cook. I know when we lived in uh, Maine, we used to go to the dock um, and get fresh lobster. 
um, nice. for like it was like two dollars a pound. I mean, we got them dirt cheap, uh-huh. um, and uh, we usually uh, that'd be dinner that night. You know, we'd go and we'd, yeah, we'd spend like ten bucks and get enough for the whole family. Um, you know, could get four or five lobsters. That's all you really needed. Um, yeah. And a 10, 10, 15 bucks maybe. Um, and uh, yeah, we'd, we'd eat them that night. Yeah. With taters. With taters. Yeah. With taters. The Australian government, embarrassed by the failure of the operation, decided to withdraw the troops and end the conflict. By all accounts, the emus had won, with maybe 300 birds being killed in the initial war. But this wasn't the end of the story. Far from it, actually. The emus refused to leave, thanks to a drought that pushed them further into the farmlands. Farmers once again asked the Australian government for help. James Mitchell, the premier of Western Australia, was more than happy to lend his support to the renewal of the military emu killing forces. In case you're wondering what a premier is, it's a state-level prime minister sort of position. So it's kind of like a governor. Yes. Of the state. But... For some reason, they equate it with a prime minister as opposed to a governor because they have governors. <clears throat> so I don't know. Okay. I don't know fully the extent of it because it doesn't it doesn't really mesh well with our government. So I had nothing to really understand to compare it with. So well, Australia, even at this time, still um there are, there's Australia, uh, if I'm not mistaken, is still under the rule of the Queen, uh, or, or you know now the King. It's, it's still um, kind of technically a colony, of, yeah, of England, mm-hmm. um, or Great Britain, or you know British Isles, whatever you want to call it. Um, GB and yeah, GB. Um, and so the Prime Minister sort of position. So to me, that would sound like that's like the the President. Right, so... No, so Australia has a prime minister, and then there are, like, different regions have a, premi- a premier. Right, that's what... Okay, that's what I was getting at. Okay, yeah. Okay, sorry, yeah. So I was trying to trying to think, like, what, what could we compare it to? And I guess it would still be, like we said, like, it would be essentially be a governor mm-hmm. only, because Australia would have the prime minister as a head uh-huh. of Australia. Um, and then... The premiers would be equivalent to like a governor or maybe maybe like a baroness or something or kind of I, I think yeah I'm not, I'm not, I'm not entirely, entirely, sure. entirely sure what the rules are for a baron but from what it sounds like a governor is a more equivalent mm-hmm. and then they have govern like other governors underneath them who uh, who have to answer to them for the more smaller chunks of land like, like towns a mayor. and stuff like that yeah I think like a mayor for the U.S. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the Western region of Australia was where this was all taking place, so it was also his job to make sure that agriculture wasn't demolished. The second operation, having been brought to the Senate by the Minister of Defense, George Pierce, and heavily defended, began on November 13th, 1932, in the same area as the first. This time, they deployed more troops, and the operation was better planned. We hope so. <laughs> the soldiers were given orders to kill as many emus as possible. Once yeah, don't again, don't hold back this time. Yeah, we're not holding. Not yeah, just don't hold back. Get them all. Yep. Get them all. Kill them all. That's uh, right. Once again, they were armed with Lewis guns. They also had Meredith in charge of the armed force for lack of experienced machine gun runners. Much to the joy of Meredith, the second operation was more successful than the first. The soldiers made, and this is a direct quote. 986 kills with 9,860 rounds at a rate of exactly 10 rounds per confirmed kill, according to Meredith, with 2,500 more dying over time from injuries. However, the emus still proved to be a tough opponent. It was reported in Cool Guardian Minor that, criticized in many quarters, the method proved effective and saved what remained of the wheat. The second operation continued for several weeks, but it eventually came to an end in December, making both wars one month, one week, and one day long. While the soldiers had managed to kill a significant number of emus the second time around, it was clear that they had not succeeded in eradicating the pest problem. Emus continued to cause damage to crops, and the government decided to pursue other methods of control, such as erecting taller and stronger fences. So, why did Australia go to war with emus, and why did they lose? Twice. How did it affect the country as a whole, and what is the legacy of this funny and futile attempt at nuisance wildlife management? 
Well, addressing your first question, Smarticus, there are stories from the original inhabitants of the Australian continent about how they caught the great big birds by using their natural curiosity against them. This, it seems, the government didn't bother to consult about. Instead, they got overzealous using a big gun to mow down some birds they didn't consult an ornithologist about. They assumed that the emus would be easy to take down, which was one of those mess around and find out moments for the Western region. Impressively, they did this not once, but twice. Still, they got to shoot two big guns. Only two? Only two. I know, no fun for anybody else, just the two gunners. <laughs> yeah. Now y'all just gotta just be there. Just, you know, go pick up the feathers when we're done, honey. Uh-huh. Good job. Maybe if they used more guns, it would have been more successful. Well, if they'd also just, like, you know, corralled them a bit better. It's like herding ducks. It's not yeah, that complicated. Herd, I was gonna say, like, well, I was gonna say, like, herd sheep, not ducks, but yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know if you herd ducks. Do you herd ducks or do you? I know you yeah. herd sheep. So you, is that what it's called? It's still called herding ducks? It's still hurting. I guess, yeah, I guess it still have, would be. Yeah, I don't know why I would think it would be something different. When I was younger, when I had to go stay, when I had to go deal with my my biological dad, mm-hmm. we would, um, he had ducks and I loved them so, so much because they were hilarious. But what you would do is you'd like, so I see my tiny screen here. You just kind of wave your arm a little bit over here and they kind of go this way. You do this and you get them into their pens. So that way they aren't going to get eaten in the middle of the night by a coyote. <laughs> I've heard they're they're pretty smart sometimes when they want to be. Oh yeah, and they're um, also they're also little jerks yeah. sometimes too, and they're smart. Like crows are incredibly smart. They'll use tools to oh. get stuff out. And... Yeah. Oh yeah. Anyways, regardless of negative media opinion and the barely measurable success of these two wars, the farmers requested the same help in 1934, 43, and 48. These requests were denied. <laughs> right. Instead, the bounty system they had in place for other species were made to include the emu. By 1934, 57,034 bounties were claimed in six months. At the same time, from the 1930s and on, exclusion barrier fencing was implemented. These also did the same job of preventing dingoes, rabbits, and other vermin out of agricultural areas. The decision to use military force to control the emu population was controversial, though not unheard of. And some people argued that it was a waste of resources. There's always somebody who mm-hmm. just wants to cut in on everyone's fun. Right. Not to mention a cruel way to treat animals, let alone the nation's official bird. Yeah, get that. It's their official native, like national bird. It's on their freaking flag. And they're like, we'll just take out some machine guns and mow them down. Yeah, that's that's pretty bad for... Uh, like nation pride, I guess I should say. Right? I mean, you, could you imagine? Yeah. Like, with all the laws we've got here protecting bald eagles? Oh, yeah. Yeah, if you if you shoot down a bald eagle, even accidentally, like, I'm pretty sure you still go to jail. Mm-hmm. So. I mean, if you look at it wrong, they get pissy about it. Yeah. <sighs> Others, however, argue that the emu problem was a serious threat to the livelihoods of farmers and that harsh action needed to be taken to protect the crops. Regardless, the aftermath of the Great Emu War was a mixed bag. While the emu population was not eradicated, the government did take steps to reduce the damage they caused to crops, including implementing stronger fencing and other nonviolent measures. Additionally, the incident sparked a national conversation about conservation and animal welfare that continued long after the conflict ended. While the whole event may seem comical, so much so that John Cleese of Monty Python and some other comedians have decided to make a live-action movie about it, the war was a serious issue for Australian farmers in the early 20th century. It highlights the challenges of balancing environmental concerns with economic needs, and is a reminder that even the most seemingly trivial conflicts can have lasting impacts while revealing important lessons. In the end, the Great Emu War remains a quirky and memorable moment in Australian history, and a testament to the resilience and ingenuity of the emu bird. We hope you've enjoyed learning about this fascinating and little-known conflict, and we encourage you to join us again next time as we explore more historical curiosities on Smarticus Tells History. Thanks for listening to Smarticus Tells History. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to rate and review and make sure to subscribe. And be sure to follow the show at facebook.com slash Smarticus Tells History, or just click the link in the show description. Thanks again for listening. See you next time.